Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Ron Weinstein, who is the originator of Tuxedo Gig Bags. Ron, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Bart. Yes, uh, we've been talking for a while. This that, that seems to be a theme on the show recently where I'm kind of getting uh, a lot of people such as yourself where we've been talking for about a year almost. In September, it'll be a year. Um, and we're finally making it happen. And um, I want to say really quickly, thank you to Greg Chatteranek. I'm sorry about butchering your last name, um, who sent me a nice message and copy and pasted basically a very cool story that Ron told on the Slingerland Sets and Snare Drums Facebook group. And that prompted this whole thing. And uh, now here we are today to kind of really dig deeper into the origins of, of uh, tuxedo bags. So all that being said, Ron, why don't you just go back to the beginning and um, how did all this start? Well, the, the tuxedo start happened around 1981. Uh, I was living in Las Vegas, and uh, I, I had the usual gripe a lot of guys had with cymbal bags where th they would rip out. Cymbal edges eventually would always eat through the bottom of a cymbal bag. And at that time, I, I knew this girl that sold industrial fabrics. She was a representative. And like she sold the Nomex to simpson racing for mm. those fireproof suits wow, yeah and she says there's a new fabric out and brand new and it was called cordura by dupont that she represented and they had a a, a second version called antron cordura which made it a very smooth and shiny finish and not the stubbly finish like on most corduras today that you see so i said wow now that stuff is really strong it's it was waterproof, coated on one side, and you couldn't rip it at all. Hmm. And I said, this could really work out. There are things I'd like to design a little bag that I think I could use. I said, okay. So I said, here's what I want to do. We got some of this fabric. And I said, well, a lot of times the handles, the straps always rip out in Naga hide and canvas also because yeah. they, they die out. So we got at that time also was brand new was like nylon seat belt webbing hmm. nobody was really using it for luggage and all that stuff and the plastic buckles that look like seat belt buckles you know that you see on all luggage today that lock into each other sure nobody was using those so i said well let's well, let me design something we you know and uh we we made it also so the straps once you had the handle on the on the symbol bag the straps were also sewn straight down from where they attached the handle and went around the bottom of the bag up to the other side. Mm. I said, well, this is going to hold all the weight you could possibly imagine. Yeah, because symbols are heavy. I mean, yeah. when, when you have a bag full of symbols, it can weigh, I mean, I feel like it's like 20. Could be 30, 20, 30 pounds. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I said, well, this would never rip out. And the sharp edge of the symbol you know, normally would rip out the bottom too. Not only would this cradle the symbols, we also, well, before we sewed the two halves of the symbol bag together, we ran that seat belt webbing all around between the two halves. So the edge of the symbol would rest on that nylon webbing also. Hmm. So this was really like a solid bag. And, and I said, well, you know, this is, this is really cool. We had one made by someone that she sold the fabric to was a industrial sewing company and they made me a sample of the bag and i tried it out and i said wow this is going to work and did a few refinements size wise and you know and a lining we put the laminated some foam to an inside nylon lining hmm. so all that gets pressed together and then you sew the bag so at that time i said well what if i use this stuff for a stick bag also okay so we made a pretty normal stick bag, um, but with the nylon handle. Uh, and But the unique thing, I had another idea. I said, one thing I don't like about these stick bags, when you go to strap it onto your floor tom-tom, you know, there's those straps that come out the side. Yep. And they're always, they were elastic with an S hook. Yeah, exactly. And you put the S hook through the, the lug, you know, and it, that could scratch the drum. 
but also depending on how much weight you had in the stick bag, it would move up and down. Yeah. I said, well, here's this, let's take the thinner, let's take the seatbelt webbing and attach Velcro on the end with a piece of Velcro where it attached and then sew that to the bag. And that way, A, it wouldn't stretch and B, you, you could loop it through the lug and attach it to itself and you couldn't scratch anything. Hmm. So we did that. No one had done that before. Damn. So we made a symbol bag and a stick bag, and that was the start of it. That's I love the attention to detail um, early on. I mean that that you're so right though about like you know you have this two thousand dollar drum set and that little kind of piece of metal that comes up from a normal traditional stick bag that that wraps around your little you know around the lug around the tension rod there. It's mm -hmm. then it's ruining your your drum finish. It's it's like a rash. I mean, it's kind of like if you don't protect your bass drum hoop with a bass drum pedal, um, yeah. it's 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 ruined. Well, so I want to obviously move forward here. But before we move forward, let's let me ask you the question, too. You mentioned that um, there was some predecessors like uh, you said, Naga Hyde, correct? What mm -hmm. what was the uh, I know we know it's stick bags that kind of scratch your drum, but what were people using before this, before we go forward, like what was as far as uh, symbol bags and all that kind of stuff, what were you improving upon at that point? Oh, uh, besides the Naga hide that would crack and dry out and, and rip before that, there were like, uh, like drum bags and stuff were sort of like a canvas hmm. and that's all they had. And they really didn't have any padding in them. They, you, you just covered your bag. And other than that, fiber cases. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be like, you know, the which which are not uh, I mean, it, even today, it's more heavy duty. I mean, those the fiber kind of like those are like more hard road cases, clearly. Right. Like those are for yeah, it's a little different than just putting your drum in a bag. I mean, that's a case. Right. The, the fiber cases were kind of thin. You know, it was yeah. made out of whatever they used. It wasn't plastic. You know, it was some kind of fiber. And you usually I remember years ago when I first got one, you had to like spray, you had to shellac them hmm. because if they were out in the rain, forget it. They were no good. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's what people used on the road. They used fiber cases. Yeah. And that, that happened for a long time. I actually kind of funny side note story and then we'll carry on from there. But, um, I was, so I was going to the university of Cincinnati here, the, 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 the music school there for, for audio engineering and stuff. And so I was, I was doing a lot with music. Up the street from my house, there was a bar that had a big parking lot and we would, you know, go to the bar and hang out and stuff. But one day I was uh, kind of going down the hill to my house and I looked over and I went, there is an entire set of those like fiber kind of old vintagey uh, drum cases sitting in the parking lot. <laughs> and I was like, um, in no way, I I'm not the kind of guy where I'm like, oh, that's mine. I'm taking it. But I think I, I was like, OK, whoa, I think I went home and like. Four or five hours later, I because I figured maybe a band was playing there and they left them and, you know, they would they would come back for them. Um, but I kind of thought later if it was like, you know, half the day, like later, then, OK, they're not coming back. They must have gone and there's probably no way to, to, to get them. So anyway, I drove up. I picked them up. I was looking at them. I was kind of I did look if there was like a name or something and I wanted to see if I could return them. But they uh they were nice it was it was bass drum it was two toms it was a snare it was you know the floor tom case but all of the the straps were, straps were rotted out they were they were <laughs> like it was like they had just been like snapped and there was and they were they were frayed but the the kicker that was not good was they were um uh they were sewn and connected to the case so there was no real replacing them. You'd have to use like a bungee or something, but it just even that technology then, which they seemed like they were from. I mean, at that point, this was 2010 or 2012 or something. So they must they're have been. Actually, they were actually probably, probably riveted to the case. They were riveted to the case. So I'm assuming they were yeah. from the 90s or from the 80s or something. They were just someone's right. dads who they gave them to them and then they played with them. They were shot. They were like not fixable, um, but I kept them for years and moved them from studio to studio like us drummers do when we just moved. I, I recently repaired some fiber cases for that same reason, really? believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, what I did, <laughs> real quick, I, I, I had a couple of 
of uh, like my a bass drum fiber case where the straps you know were ripped off okay so what i did i took out the rivets and i went down to the uh to a thrift store and i bought a couple for one dollar each i bought a couple of belts <laughs> black belts yeah i cut the belt to the size i wanted punched some holes in it and it, and and drilled a couple holes and put in some new rivets <laughs> and i fixed it <laughs> probably looks nicer too than the old kind of nylon-y uh like uh, that's, that's funny. Cause you're the tuxedo guy, you know, I've got a, yeah. a black belt for your tuxedo. Yeah. They were, Cause originally they were black leather straps. It's leather. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I fixed them, man. Well, you gotta, you know, it's better than throwing stuff away. I think I ended up selling the cases that I found like years later, I ended up selling them to someone who fixed them. I think for like 75 bucks or 50 bucks, which, um, not bad, but all right. Anyway, back on the timeline here. So you okay. had, you had created a stick bag and a cymbal bag um, where you're using the seatbelt material. You're using all this very modern uh, for the time material that no one else was using. So you're kind of like ahead of the curve. I love that, that you're you're looking at something and you see it and go, hey, man, that could be that I could use that for, you know, us drummers and and it could change the game. So uh, what happened from there? Yeah. From there, I showed them to to my mentor and advisor, Louis Belson. Louis to me is the all time saint of drums. Yes. And we were very close from the time I was 16 years old. And I'll go back to that yeah. story later. Sure. I showed him to Louis. He dug him. He said, well, what we got to do, what was coming up then was the, the NAM show in Los Angeles. And all the music merchants would be there. That's where everybody goes. So we said, uh, let's go to the NAMM show. So Louie and I went there, and I, and I had the one cymbal bag and one stick bag. And we, we showed them to a guy that Louie had known for years, uh, Chuck Molinari. Chuck was Bob Yeager's partner. Bob, Bob Yeager and Chuck owned the Pro Drum Shop yeah. in Hollywood. Yeah. Now, Chuck had left Pro Drum Shop and opened up his own company called Spectra Sound Percussion, where he made wind chimes and a lot of percussion products. So we went to Chuck's booth, and of course, who was there, you know, besides Chuck, I, I remember uh, oh, there were some drummers there, because uh, Louie knows everybody, we're all talking and looking, they, they dug the bag. Well, Chuck turned to me and says, uh, you know, can you, are you making these? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, I could. He says, well, let me have a hundred of each. First order. Yeah. I said, I turned to Louie, right? I said, I think I'm in business. <laughs> I mean, I knew nothing about this. You yeah. Know? And that was the start. Chuck, and he asked, could he have the uh, exclusive for the first year distributorship or first six months or a year? I said, yeah, sure. I, I don't know anybody else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I then went, had a, you know, uh, bought the fabric and went to one of the contract sewers in LA. And, uh, and I was living in Vegas at the time by then. And, uh, uh, we made up those bags and I shipped them to, to Chuck and people, he started getting some interest. People liked them. So the next NAM show that came up, uh, I think it was, I don't know who's, whose decision it was my decision or Louis, whatever, that I would get my own booth. Cause now by this time I had also made bags for the drums too. Same fabric, mm. same, almost the same construction, the, the nylon straps and, uh, on the edge, instead of just sewing the edges together, we used a plastic welting inside. You know, mm -hmm. it looks like a black strip that goes around the outside. You've seen on better products. Yeah. And on the inside, instead of the where the two pieces meet, we put what's called a, a binding tape over that. So everything was covered. Everything was strong. And when I did, I, I got my own booth, a little 10 by 10 booth at the next NAMM show. And I got a lot of interest. And what, what I would do to show how strong it was, um, I would have like a six by six inch square of that Antron nylon Cordura. Yeah. And 
I slid it with a scissor about two inches and I would give that piece to somebody. I'd say, here, you see, this? try to tear it. <laughs> well, from once it started, it won't tear. Wow. You know, you could slit it with a scissor. Sure. But, but from there, with the, you grab the two halves, you can't tear it any further. It's rip stop nylon. Wow. So I said, this is, I said, and I, at the time, originally I said, and I'm, the way these straps are sewn on, I'm guaranteeing this bag for life. Well, everybody told me, don't do that. That's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> But I was that confident. I said, look, you could stand on a bag. I had a bag. They could stand on a, a drum bag and, and pull on the handle while the bag was under their feet, and you couldn't rip it off. Wow. Wow. Man, that's a bold statement. But, I mean, really, when, you're, when things are in the back of a van or on a bus and getting thrown around and, you know, maybe your drums fall over and they get hit by something, it's nice to know that you're, um, you know, you're putting your – very, very valuable and a lot of times rare drums, you know, out in the world in a cheap case, it doesn't make sense. So it, it seems like there was a need in the market for this and you filled it. Um, and, and let me ask this. So, so, so technically you were covering and putting the tape on the inside and all this stuff to avoid there being any kind of like sharp ish edges like the zipper or anything touching the right. drum, correct? The, the zipper was totally had flaps yeah. over it. And the, the, what's where it was sewn, you know, you have ragged edges. We put that binding mm. tape over it and that way it, you know, it couldn't shred and come apart. Everything was, was covered. That's great. Were you called tuxedo bags at that point or had that, had you had that name yet? Yes. At, at, I, at that point, uh, the logo, it said tuxedo, uh, gig bags. And we had a little bow tie under the logo. Yeah. Cool. And, and, and also to make the bag, I always wanted it to look good and, and work well, but I knew a lot of times appearance is a lot. Instead of just having a little paper label or something, you know, I actually got a, a, an embroidered patch made with the logo hmm. sewn onto each bag. Yeah. I mean, it's attention to detail, which it's, I don't know, it all kind of works. Tuxedo. Attention to detail, very sharp and clean, kind of uh, not right. not sharp literally because you wouldn't have that. It'd be covered in <laughs> right. And, <laughs> you know and, I mean. and my my slogan at that time was formal wear for your axe. Ah, oh, very nice. It's true. That was the tuxedo part, and yeah. I almost think I don't know. Just the the connection to Louis Belson. Everyone thinks of a very well dressed man who's a gentleman, mm -hmm. and you know, it just all it just all fits together. Um, yeah, I mean, there's. There's nothing like him. We, you know, and then also we took a picture of Lou uh, holding up the symbol bag and the stick bag, uh, and I put it on a on a a hang tag. I put that picture on a hang tag on each bag and each item. Yeah, and uh, and Louis's signature was across the picture, and my, uh, on top of that tag it said, "Caught holding the bag." <laughs> Louis Belson. <laughs> I mean, if I remember correctly, you said Louis was not charging you. Louis is your mentor and buddy and was just happy to do it, right? Absolutely. Oh, I was what, so what nice naive, guy. you know, when I, when this thing started and, and, you know, and Louis and I showed it and we took a picture and I said, can I, I can put it on the tag. He said, yeah, sure. Whatever. I, I really, I was so naive that, you know, people like that have these big contracts, you know, with drum companies and cymbal companies and all that stuff you know, Louis just said, yeah, let's do it. Wow. Did not realize. I mean, y you obviously probably would have been successful and quality is key and people would have seen that, but man, he really, he bumped you up. Oh, having his picture on, on the, on hanging on each bag. Yeah. Was, it doesn't get much bigger than that, especially no, yeah. in those days. Nowadays, you know, I mean, he's been gone for quite some time, so it might not, you know, people might say, who's this guy? But uh, I feel like at that point, I mean, he was still, you know, a king, uh, still is obviously, but well, it, it's pretty amazing to me. And, and, you know, you being a drummer and knowing history, I mean, I, I run into somebody today, like, like even my wife, we were on the golf course. My, my, my wife ran into somebody a couple weeks ago and somehow drums came up and, and it's, Oh yeah, my, my, my kid plays drums. You know, and this guy says, Oh, and, uh, my wife says, did, do you know who Louis Belson is? And this kid, he didn't know who Louis was. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the shame. Uh, if, if, if we had YouTube TV, 
years and years ago where you could pull everybody up and learn something and see these people. They don't know. Lou used to have a line all the time. You, you have to, kn to, to know where you're going. You have to know where you came from. Yeah. Very, you very true. You studied those people. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's, I, I've had that where I'll post, you know, these drum videos and stuff and, and I get some guys and girls who comment very frequently. It'll be like, oh man, I didn't know people could play like that back then. And, and it'll be like a Buddy Rich video. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like you have a lot to, uh, to learn. It's not all this. Mo I mean, the people have been absolute monster drummers and, 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 and double bass didn't always exist. It had to come first from, you know, from someone from, from Louis, from Louis. Exactly. With the, Louis big is the originator the of, yeah. double, of double bass drums. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk more about Louis, but so I think we left okay. off on the bags with you were at the booth, you had people cutting and tearing and they couldn't do it and, and all this right. stuff. So, so it was, it was obviously, uh, you know, you were getting some attention, right? At I was getting some attention there and, you know, people didn't realize how small I was. I was shipping FOB my kitchen. You know, I mean, I, I didn't have any place. I would, sure. I had bags made up and, and shipped them out. Then I had to get a little, little warehouse, garage size type warehouse and office to, to store stuff because now I had to have an inventory of all the different size drum bags. I had a cardboard boxes to ship them in. Uh, you know, all that stuff I started to learn. And I even got a, a I had to get a loan from the Small Business Administration uh, because all that stuff costs money, and I didn't realize it. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. promotion and, and all that stuff and advertising. And I, I, the home I had at the time, I put up as collateral for that SBA loan. And that came into play later again, you know, but that's what I had to do to get this thing off the ground. And I didn't ask anybody for any money. I would never ask Louis for a dime. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure he would have helped me any way I wanted. Sure. And uh, it's just this, this the way I was. I was going to, I was going to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it worked. I got a lot of attention at that NAM show and people were coming over and studying the bags. I, I, I had, uh, it might've been my, th the next NAM show. I had these uh, Japanese guys come over they came to my booth like three or four times and they stood there and they would talk to each other in Japanese and they were holding the bags and looking at them and, you know, all this stuff. And, and I said, man, these guys are just going to rip me off. <laughs> well, it turns out the, on Sunday, the last day of the NAMM show, they came to my booth and gave me their card. They were Tama drums. Wow. Neat. And they asked me if I would make that exact same bag for them in a different color. Jeez, that's big. And I said, yeah, that was big. I said, yeah. And I can't remember the size of the other, but they gave me an order. And what I did, instead of my tuxedo patch, I put a, a Tama embroidered patch on each bag. Hmm. And they loved the way that it all looked. Wow. And they, they bought a bunch of bags from me. Uh, maybe a year or so later, they didn't really stay with me because I figured they could copy it in Japan. You know, I was yeah. at that point. But they, they gave me a substantial order. Um, a, a big music company in, in Hong Kong. I think Tom Lee is the biggest music stores mm. chain. They ordered from me. Australia ordered from me. Germany. All of a sudden, people were ordering from me, and man, I'm I'm in business. Yeah, you're actually. Uh, I mean, it's it's so it's so cool. I mean, you hear about that. It's almost like uh, like modern times. It's like these like you know like on TV like Shark Tank or something. It's like an idea right. that that really. Right blows up um so with the thomas stuff what year was that happening because i mean if it's you know 80s 90s that's really when when the japanese drums were 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 just blowing up in general i'd say tama was probably 83 okay gotcha yeah, 82 or 83 interesting that's uh and you were right there at the right time with with those brands coming in and uh, uh, yeah. Simon Phillips and all these guys. That may be I'm not sure when he actually came to Tama, but mm -hmm. um, it's they really took the market. Um, so, like you said, though, people can you were first to market with this, which is obviously very important. Right. But I'm assuming people did start to sort of encroach on your uh, you know idea yeah. a little bit. Some knockoffs did come out shortly after my first NAMM show appearance. 
um, uh, a guy named Fred Beato, Beato, made yeah. Beato bags. Mm-hmm. And it was actually a, a much cheaper version than mine. And also my bags compared to what was out there, even in his, were the most expensive. I wasn't cheap because I used the best materials. Yeah. You know, I even got tags from DuPont to hang on each, in, in each piece. You know, it said DuPont Cordura. You know, I wow. wasn't hiding anything. You know, this is it. So Fred, Fred knocked me off a little bit and he got some business because, you know, in the music industry, the store owners, they care about price more than anything. Yeah. They really do. Sure. You know, how, how cheap can you give it to me for? And, and the bag, Fred was, and, and yet even at the shows, when I would talk to Fred, you know, I never had any animosity toward any of these people. Hey, you know, do your thing, man. You know, this is mine. That's yours. Cool. Yeah. And uh, stuff like that. And then with Louis, I also went to Remo. Now, you know, the odd shape of Rototoms. Yeah. Well, I, I designed and, and made up some bags to hold the Rototoms. And that really, they liked it, but it didn't, really didn't go anywhere because they didn't want to get into bags. Mm. And then also uh, with Zildjian, you know, uh, Armin, you know, because of Louis, uh, you know, I had entries to everybody. Yeah. And, w- and I got to be friendly with, you know, w- with, with Remo and Lloyd McCausland at Remo and uh, uh, Armin Zildjian, who was a great guy, and Lenny Demuzio, who did all the, you know, the Zildjian artist relations things. And for and picked out all the everybody's symbols, hmm. you know, like if Louis sure. needed symbols, he'd call Zildjian and and Lenny Demuzio would pick him out or you know and ship them to you, whether it was Louis, Buddy, any of those guys. But like obviously, you yourself are a likable, nice guy, and that connection and mentorship basically led to your friendship with Louis, which. Louis's really great relationship and friendship and being a nice guy with these companies led to your ability to um, have these connections and have that trust. So it just kind of comes back to like good business and being nice to people and uh, and 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 down to human relationships. Um, because without that, you wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Louis wouldn't want to be around you. You you know what I mean? Like right. it's it's oh absolutely. It's pretty powerful Absolutely. stuff. You know, there's three things that I point to in all the years of my relationship with Louie, and I'll, maybe I'll throw them in here early, and we'll get back to some of the other stuff. But one of them was uh, Louie being best man at my wedding. <laughs> That's awesome. You know? uh, and then uh, when, when he was pretty old, like it was 2004 maybe, he did a concert of sacred music he premiered up in Northern California. And uh, my wife and I flew up there and surprised him. And, and at the end, you know, when you, you introduce people and you thank the orchestra and all that stuff, he introduces me in the audience as someone who's been with him over 40 years. And, you know, I mean, that like, I was crying, you know, I mean, yeah. you can't beat that. And that's even, it, that's on YouTube if anybody wants to look it up. Wow. <laughs> it's called Louis Intro of Ron and Charma, you know. That's awesome. Uh, and then I was asked, I was Paul Bear at his funeral. Hmm. And that's, Three milestones for me. Yeah. Clearly, he was a great friend to you, obviously. Um, and I mean, just the business thing. So, so yeah. you know, rewinding a little bit here. So, so you were like, um, I guess personally, I should ask, was this, this was your job? Like your nine to five job was tuxedo bags because you were a full at that point business okay so before that though i'm assuming you know you had other jobs and stuff going on what what was your like yeah. trade you know that you would be i mean obviously well, you're a drummer I, I, but. drummer you know originally um and then when i, I got to vegas I, I got to vegas i was working i got there uh, uh wayne newton brought me there oh cool and there was a uh uh he had a, a management company this is 19 uh Seven, 1971. I met him. Uh, Wayne was a guest. Louis had known Wayne because he appeared in his show at the time. But 1970, Wayne was a guest on the Pearl Bailey show on ABC TV. Pearl being Louis's wife. Yes. And I, at that point, I had left uh, New York. Uh, I finished it at Berkeley and went out there, and I was working as Louis's assistant on the Pearl Bailey show. And Wayne was a guest. 
and I got to meet him. And they had a he had a management company at the time for different acts, and they were putting a like a in those days they had what's called show bands, you know, and you'd go around the country playing all the Holiday Inns or Amada Inns, you know, in Vegas. And they they called me to see if I wanted to play in one of those bands, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. So I joined that band. And then I moved to Vegas a couple of years later, and uh, then I eventually I stopped playing. I said I, I got tired of the road. I got a little beat up mentally on the road, mm -hmm. and uh, I had this 1973. I had this girlfriend whose mother was dating a pit boss in a casino. <laughs> she says, "Hey, you want to be a dealer?" I go, "Hey, that's, yeah, I'll do that." That's you know? awesome. And uh, he and in those days. To get anything in Vegas, it was all juice. Who you know, mm -hmm. you know. And he puts me in as a as a twenty one dealer. And before you know it, after twenty five years, I did everything from break in dealer to casino manager. Wow! I ran the opera in, in strip casinos. Cool. So I had a great career there too, but didn't stop playing. You know, I played once in a while and practiced. And you know, my relationship with Louis was still solid all those years. And uh, and that's that was my most of my time in, in Vegas. This episode is brought to you by Nikki Moon Custom Symbols. Nikki Moon Custom Symbols are premium quality boutique symbols handmade in the USA. Nick Marguerite, owner and craftsman, is a classically trained professional independent symbol smith with over 10 years experience who has traveled all over the world studying with masters and working in symbol factories to perfect his craft. Nikki Moon offers a wide range of fully customizable series and models to choose from, including Sentinel, Dirty Angel, Custom Shop, Stainless Steel, and the critically acclaimed One Series. Nikki Moon also provides full service symbol modification and repair services. Any old symbol can be sent in, reworked, and reimagined into something completely new and different. The possibilities are endless. Get in touch at NikkiMoon.com. And all Drum History Podcast listeners can get 10% off their next order by using coupon code DRUMHISTORYPOD. That's DRUMHISTORYPOD. Go to NikkiMoon.com, N-I-C-K-Y, Moon.com to learn more and follow them on Instagram at NikkiMoon underscore symbols. All right. Now getting back on to tuxedo bags. All right. So you were starting to get ripped off. You said uh, Beato, which I've always called it Beato. Bags. Yeah, I didn't know if it was I, Beto. I, I called it Beto too, but I think he, he's Hispanic. I think he calls it he he calls it Beato when he as his name because that's his last name. Sure, sure. Um, there's so many names where he, people Tama, Tama, Paisty, Pasty, Beto, yeah. Beato. <laughs> um, all right. So then, what happened from there? You know, you're kind of I think you said mid '80s. Let's say you're you're getting kind of ripped off a little bit, but you're going strong. Right. You're working with Remo. You're working with Zildjian. Uh, take right. it from there. Yeah, well, actually, I made a bag for Zildjian, and they liked the bag. But Zildjian was really growing uh, commercially at that point. Even though everybody loved Zildjian, you know, all of a sudden they went, uh, they got a, you know, a president, and you know, all of a sudden they were. It wasn't just Armin running the company anymore. You know, yeah. it was all these corporate suits. So they, then they came out with the Zildjian bag, and it was it was different than mine, but they didn't, you know, that didn't go anywhere. But you know, but I did show them the bag. And I stayed very friendly with with, with Zildjian uh, through the years after that. Even just you know, as friends, there was a there was a time in 1979. Louis uh, Slingerland Drums had the Louis Belson National Drum Contest for best drummer, eighteen I think eighteen and under, hmm. which Louis had won when Gene he was Krupa. seventeen. The Gene Krupa contest. Yeah. Well, they put together the Louis Belson National Drum Contest when he. Went with Slingerland then in 79. So, and I remember we were, the, the finals were in Vegas and uh, we're at this reception. And I'm standing there, I'm talking with, uh, with Armand and Lenny. Do you know Lenny DiMuzio, who he is at all? No. Um, okay. I feel like the name has probably come up, but I, not off the top of my head, yeah. no. He also has a book out called Tales from the Symbol. He died just a couple years ago. Okay. Tales from the Symbol Bag, all his stories with people and you know, he, he was the artist rep and everything for, I don't know, 30, 40 wow, years. Wow, I'll have to check that out. So he's the guy. Cool. And, uh, and, and there's actually a picture in there of me with Louis and Wayne wow. in that book. But So we're standing around talking, and Armin says to me, have you seen these new, I think they were the quick beats, the, 
the hi hats with the holes in the bottom symbol. Yeah, I think quick beats. I think new beats, no, no hole. Okay, so he, so Armin says, "Have you seen these th- these quick beats?" I go, "No, I haven't seen them yet." He says, "Yeah, look." He says, "They got these holes in the bottom. They're really nice." He says, "What are you playing these days?" And I said, "Well, I'm using a 20 inch, you know, ping ride and an 18 inch medium ride and a, and a 16 crash and everything." He says, "Yeah, okay, that that sounds good." Well, Two, three days later, there was a package at my door, a whole set of symbols from Armand Zildjian. Wow. I mean, how do you beat those guys? <laughs> That's... Those old school guys. Yeah. Unbelievable. Just amazing. That is just so cool. I mean, a set of symbols now, then, whenever is expensive. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's, a, that's a nice little perk for, but you're an industry guy at that point, you know? I mean, you're- At that point, right. Yeah. But I was still playing. He says, you're still playing? I go, yeah, once in a while. He says, what are you playing? And I told him the sizes, and that's what he sent me. Good memory, too, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, Armand was great. And even, even over at Remo, when I would hang out with Lloyd McCausland, who was the guy that ran all the production and stuff at, at Remo, you know, he made sure, you know, I, I, I told him what drums I had. And, oh, I got a box of, all, of drum heads for Remo, you that's know. Awesome. And, and, uh, Which I mean, Louis, uh, Louis Mr. Remo. I mean, as far as I right. know from doing previous episodes, I mean, he was like a stockholder with Remo. I mean, he, he, he's right. all he, about it. He's one of the, he was listed, I have his business card as vice president, but that was because, you know, when Remo started, Louis actually probably funded him to start Remo. Mm. Man, Louis has his, you know, his his uh, legacy kind of spread all around the place, um, which, Absolutely. which is great, so. Absolutely. All right. Well, keep going from there. Well, at that point, I'm in business now about four years, and I'm just trudging along. And I went back to the for more advice to the Small Business Administration, and they said, "Well, at this point, you know," I said, "I got. I need more marketing and, and advertising and, and promotion." And they said, "Well, you need like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for marketing." You got to take out ads, mm-hmm. you know, you got to reach all these people. And I said, well, I, I can't get that. You know, I don't have it in this and that. So uh, I'm figuring, well, I'm about to sell what I have and get out of the biz. Mm. So at the different NAM shows, though, I, I had met and talked to uh, Erwin Berg from Humesenberg. Mm-hmm. And they they made road cases you know and they made they were the biggest company that made fiber cases for 50 because they had already been in business 50 years uh erwin berg's father willie berg started the company over 50 years ago and they made you you know trumpet mutes called stone mutes they're white with that red Mm -hmm. i think that's humes and berg mutes cool and that's where they started and then they got into fiber cases and, and band equipment and stuff. So they're in business 50 years. And I got friendly with Erwin. We were just, uh, you know, we used to tell jokes to each other. Erwin Berg, Ron Weinstein, two Jewish guys at the NAM show would just, you know, laugh it up. And uh, it, was, it was funny that he, li- he liked my bags but didn't, know, didn't really want to know what to do with it. Well, I was home. I think it was around it was in October maybe 84. And I get a phone call like at seven in the morning and it was Erwin Berg. And he says, you know, Hey, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I'm just trudging along. And in my head, I already was going to go out of business at the end of the year. He says, are you interested in any kind of, you know, me buying your, your product? I go, well, yeah, talk to me. You know, <laughs> what do you got in mind? And again, I didn't really know from much. And well, you know what he says, well, let me get a, a contract going. And me, I was going to go, okay, you want to give me something? Fine, it's yours, you know? Well, all of a sudden I get this 25-page lawyer yeah. contract, you know, with all these ins and outs. And, you know, I, I said, yeah, okay, it's yours, you know? He paid off, they paid off the loan that I had with the SBA, and he got all the the designs. But uh, by that time also, I was making uh, guitar bags, and trumpet bags, mm-hmm. saxophone bags. And they took all the designs and they, they owned it all and they were going to make it. And I just had to appear at the next couple of NAM shows at their booth as a representative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that was it. He 
come January at the next NAMM show, it was Humes and Berg's tuxedo bags. Man. I mean, it. you sound like you're just a very, um, I don't want to say, I guess, like happy-go-lucky kind of guy. Were you at all like, this is my baby, I'm getting rid of it? You honestly don't sound like, you sound like you're like, I had a great time, I had a good experience, and uh, I was kind of done with it. W- did you have any, what were your emotions like with that? My emotions were, it wasn't like I was done with it. I really loved it. Like you said, that was my baby. But then I said to myself, well, here's a situation. Humes and Berg has been in business over 50 years. You know, they don't have to sell to distributors. They sell direct to every music store. They sell direct to every school system, you know, band risers, band equipment, all that stuff, bandstands. I said, who better to take this where it can go? I couldn't take it to the ultimate. And they could. And so it was like a natural, I was proud that, that they did it. And I was able to get out of it without losing a dime, you know, and it was just fun. And at the time I go to that next NAMM show with Irwin and, uh, his son was there, Mike Berg, yeah. who runs it now. Mike was like 15 or 16 and we just teased him unmercifully, you know, Mike. <laughs> and he's a great kid, and he's running the whole shebang now. Yeah. Irwin is pretty much retired. And what he's done with it now, uh, I mean, the, those cases he puts out, you know, the hard, hard cases. Yeah, they're really cool. They're, they're, they're great and all the colors. And at the time, even Irwin, what he did to get Tuxedo produced, he was – he, he still used a, a sewer in the United States, to, my sewer in California, actually. And then he set up his own sewing factory in East Chicago, Indiana, where Humes and Berg is. And then it got so big where he set up and still has his own bad company. They make the bed in China directly. Mm. And that's his, he's not having somebody in China make it. He set up his own sewing operation in China. Wow. And as far as soft bags are concerned, and they've made other types now. They got the tuxedo, they have the fuzzy kind, you know, they have different levels of, of soft bags now. Yeah. But, but basically, like the tuxedo bags are sewn, still sewn exactly the same way. And they're the largest gig bag company in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, if they were kind of known and are known as the hard cases, then why not include the most uh, high quality? Um, soft bag under the umbrella. So I think you you obviously yeah. chose the right you know. Yeah, it was a with. natural extension for them. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, and and it sounds like you had a great time, and like like you said, you had fun. You, I'm sure, could support yourself uh, with yeah as a job selling these cases, and boom, you're in the industry and uh, and all that stuff. So, so where does it stand um, today? Obviously, so so Humesenberg is still making them. Oh yeah, they still make tuxedo. Uh, if you look at on their website or the catalog, they still show it. You know, they like I said, they make a couple other lesser quality bags, but pretty much sewn close to it. But the fabric and stuff is a little different. They have different price points for different music stores yeah. now. And uh, Erwin, even a few months ago, called me up, you know, just out of the blue. Hey, how you doing? You know, and if I see something that Mike posts on his Facebook page, I, you know, I always say, so, hey, partner, what's going on? (laughs) You know, even though I I get nothing, you know, (laughs) from them today. But, uh, you know, I did get some royalties for the first couple of years initially. That's great. You know, and it was great. I like that you also were like going to like the small business association and asking for help and doing this stuff. Cause I think sometimes people forget that like there are resources, um, that are there to help you. And, and obviously they said you need a ton of money. Um, and that right. kind of led to this, but, but just, you know, you can be just a guy, just a drummer, um, you know, who's not a, you didn't go to business school for this stuff and get like an NBA. So Right. Um, it's pretty cool that any, any, anyone can do it, but it's, it's obviously a lot of hard work. Um, all you have to do is know one of the most famous drummers in the world who will open that. Was that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the only, <laughs> that's the only thing you need. Um, but all right. So on that note, let's rewind. How did you meet Louis Belson when you were 16? I mean, how did your relationship with him ha- happen? Well, uh, being a drummer from the time I was like, say, say 13, I had a snare drum and a hi-hat and a cymbal. When I 
turned 16, the day I turned 16, um, my oldest brother co-signed a little note for me at the local music store in upstate New York, where I'm from. And I got a Rogers set because my favorite drummer, just listening and watching, was Louis Belson. Mm -hmm. And he played Rogers then. And I got a Rogers set. And then at that point, and I could, and I got a job, and the music store let me pay twenty five dollars a month till it was paid off. And in those days, drum set was you know three hundred dollars mm -hmm. for a Rogers set. You know. So I did that, and I was playing. So now I was sixteen. A little later, that that was in May. A little later, October, I get my issue of Downbeat magazine in the mail, and on the cover was a picture of Louis Belson. It says Louis Belson back with Duke. And I, I just, wow, hey, that's, that's great. And I look in my low in the New York newspaper, a couple within a few days or so, and I see coming to Basin Street East, a famous nightclub in New York City, Duke Ellington and his orchestra. Hmm. Well, I figured, well, that's, man, if Louis is back with Duke, I'm going. I lived about an hour north of New York City at the time. And at that point, I said, well, I want to go see Louis Belson. So my father took me, we drove into the city uh, to Basin Street to see Louis Belson. And there, there it was, uh, we got a seat. In those days, you know, nightclubs, you know, he had a stage and there was just like long tables that came, emanated from the stage. But we sat right in the front, right in the middle in front of Louis' drums. Mm. And I'm waiting, uh, I, I can't wait to see Louis Belson. And I see there's a swinging door towards the, in the rear of Basin Street where the musicians are starting to come out. And there's no curtain at this club in Basin Street. The musicians are coming out and putting their horns on the stage. So I said, uh, I said I'm going to go through that door, see what happens. I walk through that door and I literally bump into, physically bump into Louis Belson and Duke Ellington. <laughs> oh, boy. They were talking. And I started stammering. I said, oh, oh Louis, I said, uh, I came a long way to see you tonight, you know, and, <laughs> you know, this is great. And, you know, little did I, I'm practically, I'm ignoring Duke Ellington. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and then I turned to him, I said, Mr. Ellington, could you have Louis do a drum solo? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm asking Ellington. To do. And, you know, he didn't say anything. I mean, I talked to Louis and then we got a, a typical uh, club a camera girl in those days came back. And took a picture of me and Louie. Hmm. Not with Duke, though. I wish I would have had that in there. But it was just me and Louie. And I'm holding the sticks. And he's holding the brushes, you know. And we got that picture taken. Wow. Now I go back out to, to the club. I sit there. And here comes. Now the, the show starts. The, the opening act was a very, very young, nobody knew, Joan Rivers. And after, then Ellington plays. And then Mel Torme was coming out to sing. But so I'm watching Ellington and I'm, I'm flipping out because Louie's right in front of me. And, you know, you've seen videos of Louie, his personality, always smiling mm -hmm. and looking at people. He just emanates. And they played skin deep. And that totally knocked me out. Now, when that show is over, I follow Louie off stage and go back there and we start talking again. And, you know, I tell him what a big fan I am and all that stuff. And, you know, when I want to see him. He gives me, this is Louis Belson. Oh, I, I showed him a picture of me on my Rogers set, a little Polaroid, and he signed the back of that for me. Wow. And then he, he gives me his home address and phone number in Southern California. Wow. Who does that? Yeah, really? You know? Hmm. So that was my entree to Louis. I would keep, I would write him. Occasionally I would call. I had, I was, I had, Huge fear to call him because sometimes Pearl Bailey would answer the phone and she would frighten me to death, <laughs> uh, you know, and, but, uh, but he stayed and he always responded to me if I wrote him something. And then he told me he was coming to New York. And I can't remember if that time he was coming with Harry James band or his big band at the, uh, the riverboat in the Empire State Building it was a nightclub in the basement of the riverboat. And you know, would I come help him be the band boy? I said, well, yeah, sure. You know, uh, I did that. I, I, so I would take the bus from New, from where I lived into New York City at night 
And I was there with, with Louie every night, watching him play every night. Um, you know, another time he came into the city with Pearl Bailey. She was going to be on the Ed Sullivan show. He called me up and said, yeah, he said, hey, I'm going to have a, a lesson tomorrow with Saul Gubin, who is the timpaniist for the New York Philharmonic. Louie was going to have a lesson with him. Mm. You, know, you want to meet me? I said, oh, yeah. Again, I took the bus into the city. I met him there. You know, it just our relationship grew. For some reason, of all the people that Louis meets, yeah. you know, why did he, you know, stick with me? And then he came in with Harry James Band. We did the same thing. Um, uh, we were on the road one time. We went to Philadelphia to do the Mike Douglas show, all that stuff. I, everything I did was with Louis for the next couple of years. Then I got out of high school and I said, well, I'm, I spent a year on the road with a rock band out of high school. And uh, I said, well, I guess I, I want to go to Berkeley. Louis wrote a letter of recommendation and made a phone call to somebody in Berkeley. And there I was. I got into <laughs> Berkeley without an audition. <laughs> wow. Oh, so, man. Yeah, the Louis you, effect. <laughs> you, 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 can't, uh, you can't beat these stories. No. I mean, and so I, after, I spent two years at Berkeley and, and loved it. And then he told me that uh, Pearl was going to get a TV show, ABC. I said, well, I'll come out and help. You know, I want to move out there. And he says, well, you know, it's real tough in L.A. these days. I said, I don't care what I do. You know, so I moved to L.A. in uh, September of 1970 and was there as his assistant on the Pearl Bailey show. And it, and we'd be in the music office, and, and the, each week the guest stars would come in, like on Monday, and go over the music with Louie, and then the arrangers would make their charts, and then Friday there'd be a run-through, Thursday, Friday, and then taping Friday night. The guests that Pearl had on that show for 13 weeks, we had Ellington, we had Basie, we had Louis Armstrong, uh, uh, Mel Torme, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, Tony Bennett, Lucille Ball, Bing Crosby, everybody who was anybody was in Louis's office that week, yeah. you know, that I would get to hang with. That's so cool. And that was the end of an era. Yeah. Yeah. Those variety kind of, you know, uh, those shows like that where there'd be performers, they just, you know, they're so cool. There's, I feel like kind of variations of it now, but it's almost more competition based and it's just... It was something special right. in those days. And it, it only lasted, the ratings weren't bad on ABC, they said. The reason that they, they canceled it after just 13 weeks, it was too expensive for them to produce. Yeah. With all those, those guest stars. Big and names and you're there for a yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, there were stories I remember of guest stars. And I was always, it was one of the things that's funny, I was always like Louis' earpiece. You know, Louis meets, I mean, he, would, he would forget details. And I remember, this is now in 1970, beginning of 71, Joan Rivers came to guest on Pearl's show. And she went, she goes, oh, Louie, how you do? Remember, I met you, you know, you know, five years ago, whatever, uh, you know, from 65. Yeah. And I lean over to Louie, I go, Basin Street East. She was the opening act. <laughs> and Louie goes, oh, yeah, Basin Street. That's you know? awesome. <laughs> and I was always doing that for him because I remembered all the details. Jeez. Yeah, because for you, it's like a mind-blowing, once-in-a-lifetime thing. And for him, it's like, right. that's every day. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So that's that evolved, you know, into my relationship with Louie. And we stayed close over the years. Every place I ever lived, whether it was a little apartment in, in L.A., or my little apartment in Vegas, and then a house, and then house. Louis would always come visit. Um, you know, we were just like father and son. Hmm. It, it was amazing. I knew his his sisters, his brother. Uh, it was just there was just nothing like it. Wow, you're. I don't want to say lucky because there's always the sayings of like, well, hard. You know, luck is made by hard work and by being in the right places and stuff. But yep. it's really. You're right, though, where you're like, why did he choose you there? He obviously saw something in you and um, and you guys just got along that that happens sometimes with, you know, if you're kind of quote unquote, I guess his assistant or whatever, he's got to like you and want to spend time with you. And um, and he had that relationship with others in different times, you know, like when I like with Dave Black, who was a music student out in, in Northridge, California, uh, 
and also with Andy Weiss up in San Jose area. Um, so, you know, he's had that in different periods of his life. Different people have come in and, you know, to his life. But uh, like he like he says in that intro of me on the, that you can see on YouTube, it's we were together over 40 years. Wow. You know, and it's uh, it, it's hard for me to fathom that whole thing. When I think when I think back on it, yeah, you know? exactly, and uh, and I do plan on doing because um, you know on the show there have been biographies on other major drummers, but I'm I'm working on one with Andy, and hopefully we can get you involved. Um, a biography on Louis Belson, um, but Andy had some some health issues with COVID, and we've kind of uh, right. you know we're gonna do it when we can do it. Um, so, man, Ron, well, this has just turned into th- this is the kind of episode that I absolutely love just because it's not, uh, I mean, your story is what it's all about. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a guy who worked hard and made a cool drum company. And it's full of all these great tales of drumming legends and, and Louie and, and all this stuff. Um, so, um, I want to thank you for being here. And, and also, um, Ron, if you have a couple extra minutes, I figured we could maybe, hang out and do a little bonus episode for Patreon where maybe we talk a little bit more about, um, you know, I I always like to do on the bonus ones, like the behind the scenes a little bit on uh, some trial and error and maybe some some things that you tried where, hey, this prototype didn't work at all. And maybe there was a couple flubs here and there. And um, I like to hear about that kind of stuff and and we'll see what else comes up. So um, for people listening, if you want to hear that bonus episode, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a Patreon button, um, which you click and it's two bucks a month and up. There's other perks, but uh, you get those bonus episodes. And a big thank you to Greg Chadaranek. I'm going to have trouble with that last name for the rest of my life. So thank you to Greg um, for just he basically, Ron, as you know, he read your story online and then boom, it led to this a year later. <laughs> so you never know. Well, it's thanks. You know, thanks for for having and listening to the story. I, I I love talking about it because I, you know, everything that's happened over the years has just been like a, almost like a fairy tale to me, you know, and I don't take any of it for granted. And, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's lots of Louis stories. And one day when you do, do, do a Louis biography, you know, we can really get into some more. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be a, a two parter, uh, kind of episode. Cause there's a lot, a lot of people who love the, you know, the gentleman who is Louie. So I'm glad we could incorporate him in this episode. Um, so anyway, uh, everyone can check out the bonus episode where Ron and I are going to take a few minutes and talk. And uh, anyway, Ron, thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, I know people are going to love this one. It's It's been great. So and I do want to say too, uh, the day where I don't know when this is going to come out, but the day we're recording this, uh, Charlie Watts passed away yesterday. Today's August 25th. He passed away August 24th. So we just want to say, um, you know, that we love Charlie Watts and um, just we're sorry to hear about it for the band. Everyone. Another this, gentleman. Another, another gentleman. gentleman. Exactly. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to meet him in 2019, which will always be one of the most like important memories uh, in my life. So thank you to Don McCauley, who was has been with Charlie for a long time as his tech. Um, so I just wanted to say that. So anyway, uh On that note, thank you, Ron, for being here, and I look forward to uh, the bonus episode, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks again for having me, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.